This book is called Tilmuk Land of Many Waters by Ada M. Orcutt and it was copyrighted in 1951 from the Tilmuk Pioneer Museum. I'm reading this for my class as we study it at the, in the fall of the school year. So. First two chapters. Tillamook County contains enough romance to satisfy the most adventurous nature. This side of our story deals with the mysterious shipwrecks, hidden treasure, red-haired Indians, and the strong possibility that Negro blood flowed in the veins of the good Chief Kilchis. Just why, what might have been the home ports of any other of all prehistoric wrecks on the Tillamook coast is no, a, not a matter of authentic record but it has been the subject of much speculation by experts and others. There was a story among the Indians of an enterprising Chinese sailor whose ship was wrecked on Tillamook Beach. This cunning oriental is supposed to have built other ships and turned freebooter to exact tribute from all the Indian tribes living along the coast. It is known that Oriental ships were wrecked on the shores of North America, but it would be difficult to find any other explanation for the large amounts of teak wood found along the Oregon coast. The fact that this iron-like wood found by the early pioneers showed considerable wear and deterioration supports the belief that at least some of these ships were wrecked many, many years before the coming of the white man to this region. Doubtless, the Japanese current which is in our own time has brought the glass floats of the Japanese fishing fleets to Tillamook shores in the wake of winter storms has carried the junks of the Oriental sailors to disaster in the same manner. This is the story of the white man wrecked about 1760 and rescued by a family of Nahalem's butcher Indians. This white man, supposedly a Scot, was said to have a white face and red hair and a beard, something new to the Nahalem's. This man later married into the family that rescued him and moved with him to Clatsop, where his descendants were spoken of by Lewis and Clark and John Minto. In New Light on the History of the Greater Northwest, Volume 2, under date of December 8, 1813, says Alexander Henry, the old Clatsop chief arrived with some excellent salmon and the meat of a large bitch. There came with him a man of about 30 years of age who was extraordinarily dark red hair and a sup supposed offspring of a ship that was wrecked within a few miles of the entrance of this river many years ago. Great quantities of beeswax continue to be dug up out of the sand near this spot and the Indians bring it to trade with us. A later entry of February 28, 1814 stated, they bring us Frequently lumps of beeswax fresh out of the sand, which they collect on the coast to the south where the Spanish ship was cast away some years ago and the crew all murdered by the natives. <clears throat> These statements indicate that the red-haired Indian came from the region around the Halem River because this was the region in which the beeswax was found and it is known that the Nahalems and the Clasips mingled freely. The beeswax found on the Nahalem spit and where it came from long have been a source of interest and speculation. That a ship carrying a large cargo of beeswax was wrecked near the base of Nikani is without question. There has been proof of the fact taken from the shifting sands of the spit for over a century. Silas B. Smith of Astoria wrote the following for the Native Sun magazine. I think it is not too hazardous to identify this wreck as the Spanish ship San Jose, which had left La Paz, Lower California, June 16, 1789, loaded with mission supplies for the Catholic mission in San Diego, Upper California, and which nothing was ever heard after she left port. Now I'm going to stop reading there and just say this too. Since then they found that um, there was a Spanish galleon from 1640 that had also wrecked carrying beeswax and China. And that's exactly what you can still find on the beach today is beeswax and China. So, okay, back to reading. 
Every circumstance connected with the vessel and her journey favors this solution. Her course on her voyage was toward the north. Her mission supplies would include beeswax or some other kind of wax as an article that would be in, needed for images, tapers, candles, etc. We find that some of the blocks of beeswax from this wreck were inscribed with a Latin abbreviation I H S I dot H dot S dot uh, Jesus hominum salvator, which abbreviation is, I believe, largely or commonly used in the Roman Catholic Church. This vessel falling in, in all par probability, with a storm at sea while on her northward course, was driven away from her point of destination and met her fate on the sands at the mouth of the Nehalem River. The matter of the finding of the beeswax some 200 yards from the sea is accounted for by the fact that perhaps the crew endeavored to save the cargo and carried a part of it there, which afterwards became buried by the drifting sands. And so we have one historian's opinion of the beeswax ship. In 1565, the Spanish government began sending one ship a year to the Philippines for trade, a service which continued for some 250 years. Both the date 1789 was given by Mr. Smith in the day 1679, which appears in large part a piece of wax now in the Pioneer Museum in Tillamook. <coughs> Fall within a 250-year period of the Manila gallons, galleons, as these ships are called. Now, I just want to say, too, on the side, that um, the ships, the farther north they would travel, um the quicker the winds are, the trade winds or the jet stream. <clears throat> so if you travel farther north, your ship's going to go quicker and reach, um, sail across the Pacific. And then in the summertime, the winds blow from the north and then it could blow your ship south to California or wherever you're going. Okay, back to read. It has not always been accepted. The accepted fact that the wax found on the Nehalem beach was true beeswax. It was first pronounced ozokerite, a substance of mineral origin that is considerable economic importance. In fact, some people use it for oil. It was also identified by the commissioner in charge of the Australian, Austrian exhibit of the Columbian Expedition in 1893. In the same year, it was examined by George P. Merrill, <coughs> head curator of the Department of Geology. United States National Museum, Washington. He said that the gray outside color showed oxidation, but the interior had characteristics of genuine beeswax. Yet it was his opinion that a vessel could not carry as much wax as reportedly found. Mr. Merrill did not then have enough information to give a definite opinion. After more careful study, he came to the conclusion that it was beeswax and Judge J. Wickersham of Tacoma, Washington published an article showing the possibility of a shipwreck and error in the quantity referred to by Merrill. Another article by C.D. Hiscox of New York quoted many statistics regarding the Ozergarite, but evidently Mr. Hiscox never saw a sample of the Nehalem beeswax. Dr. Dealer, one of the ablest field geologist of the United States Geological Survey came to examine the wax fields. <coughs> His findings showed that the wax is found in a single locality, that a few generations ago the sea reached the place now occupied by the wax, that the wax is not derived from the adjacent land, and that the chemical test showed it to be beeswax, not ozocorite. And so the mystery the uncertainty, the arguments raged, it was wax, but they could not agree what kind. Closely connected with the beeswax ship is the story of the treasure ship. Many accounts say that the beeswax ship and the treasure ship were one and the same, but other accounts indicate that they were two different vessels. The author is inclined toward the latter view, for it seems unlikely that a ship of that time would carry both wax and treasure in large quantities, as the stories indicate. Although details of the most fabulous of Oregon shipwrecks may vary, 
The main trend of the story is the same. A ship loaded with chests was wrecked someplace on the South Neocani. The crew of the ship is said to have dug a great pit on the side of the mountain and buried the chests they took from an ill-fated vessel. Some accounts are that this burying process lasted as long as, as long as two years. Others say it took a couple of months, but the chests were in place in this pit, and the men killed one of their crew in the presence of the Indians and threw his body on top of the chest. The pit was filled in, and because of the great reverence these natives had for the final resting place of the dead, they made no attempt to find out what the strangers had hidden. In fact, the white men who came in later years had great difficulty in winning the confidence of the Indians to the point where they would tell the details that had been handed down around their campfires for so many years. <coughs> As to the fate of the crew and the treasure ship, that too is in limbo of unrecorded history. One story is that part of the crew made its way north over Neocani and presumably was picked up by a ship that put into the Columbia. Another story is that the crew members who said who stayed to bury the treasure grew restless after their task was completed and turned to evil ways. Supposedly they began to rape the maidens and the Nahalims and as a result were massacred by the Indians. The lure of the lost or buried treasure has been irresistible to the romantic and adventurous. That of Neocani has certainly been no exception. Hundreds of thousands of dollars have been spent in efforts to fund the fabulous cash, but Neocani has guarded its secret well. Pat Smith is the name that comes first to mind when the Parade of Treasure Seekers is reviewed. In Pioneer Days of Oregon History, Volume 1, S.A. Clark quotes Thomas H. Roberts, Rogers, who wrote two interesting novels based on the story of the Nahalem Treasure Ship. This is a quote. I've been asked to tell what I know about the inscription bearing rocks found on the side of the Nakarni Mountain. <coughs> Many people believe they pertain to immense Spanish treasure, which according to legend lore is supposed to have been taken from the much talked about beeswax ship and secreted on the mountainside sometime in 1700. Others believe this treasure to be the spoils of a pirate craft, which, after looting one of the Spanish king's galleons on Manila and Acapulco route, put into the coast for safety. <coughs> and after securing their ill-gotten gain and marketing this, marking the spot, sailed away, never to be heard for, from evermore. My attention was called was first called to these stones while on a pleasure jaunt to the Nahalem County in September of 1897. Our first day out from Garibaldi took us to the residence of Mr. Lil, who resides one and a half miles from south of New Kearney. Our host was in a reminiscent frame of mind that night, and as we sat before the cheerful fire, he told story after story of the beeswax ship. Our host told of several chisel marked stones being unearthed in a neighborhood pasture many years before and the one lucky enough, in his estimation, to decipher the hidden meaning traced thereon, would ultimately find the great sp Spanish treasure. He advised us to hunt up Mr. P. H. M. Smith, who resided near, who had spent the, la the past seven years in hunting for the treasure, as well as his father before him. This we did, visiting Mr. Smith the next morning, who, contrary to expectations, was willing to talk upon the subjects, besides showing us several minute and genuine marked stones found by himself in divers, diverse places in the sand <coughs> from the mouth of the New Halem River to the little Winlock Cove north of the Kearney where the re remains of an ancient vessel now lie. This cove is likely what is now known as Short Sands Beach or Oswald West. We visited the pasture lot in which the chisel marked stones were lying. When found, these time and weather beaten stones, four in number, were lying three or four feet deep in the ground in the shape of a huge cross, 30 feet in length by 20 feet in width. Since the first was found some 20 years ago, 
They have been rolled around and sadly disfigured by some imagined smart fellow, for fun's sake, at the expense of Mr. Smith, to lead them astray in search. The one, photographed by Rogers, had evidently not been tampered with. Be these rocks tampered with or not, they were found and dug up directly west of a small stream which meanders down the mountainside to the sea. <coughs> Wherein long ago, as the legend tells, a box of gold was buried and the negro killed over it, and whose spirit is supposed to ever guard over the curious. These stones, Mr. Smith said, did not, in his way of thinking, relate to the treasure, the keystone having been found by him a quarter of a mile distant, buried to the depth of ten feet in the ground on top of the hill southeast. This keystone was also photographed. But for obvious reasons, Mr. Smith requesting it, it was not given pub publicity. The stone is not a put-up job on Mr. Smith, as many would like to make it, especially some would-be funny people who take the light, so I'm told, in pestering the treasure hunter. The ground, may, having never been molested during the past century at least, from the top of the hill, Mr. Smith pointed northwest to where a dead spruce old and time beaten rose above the underbrush, saying, Over there, this keystone tells me I will find another clue. When I find that one, I will also find another one. And so the quest will go on from day to day until I have unraveled this scheme. The keystone found by Mr. Smith was an intricate design traced upon its face, delicate almost as a spider's web, to photograph it. It was necessary to first pencil in, bringing out all the lines as plainly as the day of the designer, be he Spaniard, pirate, or civil engineer, executed it. From the top of his hill, we went back in the mountains where the treasure hunter pointed out a great hole made by a divining rod enthusiast who had delved for days and weeks and months in a place where the swinging plumb bob had ceased to its vibrations and had come to a stop like a pendulum in a clock and after weary weary work mid storms and blinding sunshine he gave up the quest and he went back from whence it came Then we went to the top of the mountain, overlooking the sea, and we saw more work of other treasure hunters, where they had blasted out great holes in the solid stone for this reputed wealth. Since the time when Rogers gave such a colorful account of Pat Smith's request for buried wealth, Smith himself spent years in strength and vain search. Many others joined the parade and quietly dropped out. Some even gave their lives on the altar of mystery and adventure. Pat Smith allowed only one man to work with him, and that man was Charlie Pike. When Pat became too old to carry on the work alone, he took Charlie into his confidence and they worked together. After Pat's death, Charlie Pike carried on the work alone. Charlie believed in the treasure too. Frank Pike, brother of Charlie, told the author the story of the Negro from the treasure ship. According to Pike's account, the Negro was the, from the treasure ship made a knife from some metal from the ship and presented it to the chief of the Nehalems. The Indians were so much impressed with the skill of the black man that when the rest of the crew was killed, the Negro was spared and became the special servant to the chief. Perhaps the Negro was pleased at having escaped with his life, but he was homesick and he would go upon the mountain and look toward the sea and he would cry. Finally, one day this negro accompanied the chief to Astoria. Here he was able to elude his family, his Indian master, and he made his way to the Willamette Valley. Frank Pike says that his uncle Daniel L. Pike, who lived near, the Dal near Dallas, Oregon, told the negro who came to Dallas and claimed that he was from the treasure ship. The black man gave the above account of his adventures with the Indians and also he told the burying the treasure. He said that they dug to bedrock 
and then chiseled into the bedrock so that in case of a slide the rock would hold the treasure from sliding into the ocean. Some of the people wanted the Negro to lead them back to New Connie so that they might recover his wealth, but he was afraid to return. <coughs> Since he'd run away from the Halems, he believed they would surely kill him if he ever fell into their hands again. The men of the proposed expedition promised their guide protection. He left the party back as far as Astoria where he contracted smallpox and he died. When he knew that he did not have long to live, he drew a map of New Connie, which was so accurate that it was evident that he'd been there. After the Negro's death, the men went on to New Connie, but they were so vague as to their objective that they returned to their homes without even digging for treasure. Frank Pike told the treasure Frank Pike told the author that it is his opinion that the mountain has slid so much that the treasure is in the ocean by now or buried so deep that it will never be recovered. Amusing were the efforts of William Snyder, one of the residents in the Halem, who tried his hand at the treasure hunting. He was digging a trench between marked rocks. At one point, his pick hit a rock that had a hollow sound. Snyder was certain that he'd found the treasure and he dug frantically. Finally, with Herculean effort, he raised a rock. Instead of the treasure he found there, it had been an industrious beaver that had tunneled under the rock, leaving the space that caused the hollow sound. In 1931, Charles Wood, his son Linwood, and his young grandson came to search for the treasure. The two older men had given the boys strict orders not to tell anyone. <coughs> where they were and what they were doing. However, when his mother, his father and his grandfather did not return to their camp for lunch or for supper, the lad became frightened and he went to the Nehalem to summon for help. Later that night, the two men were found buried in the hole that they hoped would contain the treasure. All methods of solving the mystery have been employed. Some have tried mathematical deduction, some the divining rod, and one man even restored to spiritualism, resorted to spiritualism. In later years, the newest devices for locating metal have been used. But regardless of the method employed, as far as is known, all have met with failure. It has been said that Tom McKay, son of Mr. and Mrs. John McLaughlin, was a previous marriage with a Hudson's Bay man, learned of the treasure while trapping furs in the Tillamook country. The Hudson's Bay Company herded Tom McKay and dug for the treasure, so he was recalled in question at length on the matter. The company claimed that everything discovered by the employees while they were there in the company service was company property. Tom McKay denied having discovered any treasure, but he was a generous fellow and always had money to spend and give away so much that when he when he afterwards settled on the French prairie he lived so well and was so liberal to all in need that people believed that he had surely found the treasure and he gloried that he made such good use of it. There's another mystery of Tillamook County that has been the source of much speculation the ancestor of Chief Kilchis the greatest of the Tillamooks. Warren Vaughn in his unpublished early history of Tillamook gives the following description of Chief Kilches. <coughs> Quote, he was a large man with African features. His hair was, sh was curly. He had rather a high forehead, a flat nose, thick lips, and a long chin. When sober-minded, he had a sort of scowl on his face. But when pleased, his face was smiles all over. He had an African foot and curly beard. His head was erect and his body was straight. And he weighed, I should think, 225 pounds. The Indians used to say that in battle, he was one of the bravest among the men. Bravest among the brave. Owing to his great strength and agility, he was a terror to his enemies. To his friends, he was sedate and courteous. To his captives he was humane. As a chief, the Indians learned to respect and obey him. 
He was exacting his demands, and he wanted nothing but justice. I think he was strictly honest. Unquote. <coughs> Mr. Vaughn believes that Kilchis was the descendant from a sailor of the beeswax ship. He states, tradition has it that there was a Negro among those that got ashore, and that he was a blacksmith and he taught the Indians how to make their knives, and this was what saved him from being killed. Lucy E. Dowdy, who made a rather extensive study of the Tillamook County h history during her time, expressed a belief that Lupius, Captain Gray's colored boy, who was presumably killed by the Indians in 1788, he had not met such a fate after all, and that Chief Kilchis was one of his descendants. The descendants of Chief Kilchis denied that there was any Negro blood in their family, although the author has never talked with anyone who saw Kilchis. The idea is prevalent that he was of African descent. John Hathaway told the author that Kilchis died before the Hathaway family came to Tillamook, but that Bob Kilchis and the rest of the family with whom Mr. Hathaway was good friends, showed no trace of other than Indian blood. Wrecked Chinese junks, beeswax mysteriously deposited upon our shores, buried treasure, red hair Indians, and a great Indian who was part Negro. All these, be they fact or fiction, have played part of Tillamook history and have left their mark upon the county and the people. That's the end of chapter one.